in churches and synagogues, mosques and on street corners. All over our nation today, people are telling the old stories. Modern morality tales, new parables. The story of Michael Brown Jr. is now one of those stories told again and again. Michael, who as Pastor Tracy Blackman tells it, was in the street, was a black boy, big of stature, walking to see his grandmother in Ferguson, Missouri, was shot by police. His dead body lay in the hot sun in the place where he was slain for four hours. Those disrespectful and degrading hours inspired die-ins across the country month after month and now year after year. And I, I didn't know what to do, says the pastor from the city whose name now takes its place among others such as Selma and Little Rock, Birmingham and Oakland, where civil rights struggles have been fought. I, she says, I took to social media as if keystroking was activism. My clergy colleague said, we should pray. Prayer is a powerful tool. It is also a powerful cover, she says. I said, well, if all we're going to do is pray, can we at least do it in the police station? <laughs> she led an act of resistance. And yet a day later, out on the streets, following the leads of the young people who had been Michael's colleagues and friends, she realized that she needed to do something else from her faith tradition. In her faith tradition, what she needed to do was to repent because she had, in her words, committed a sin. Now, sin is an old archery term, and what it actually means etymologically is to miss the mark. This pastor confessed on a bullhorn in the streets that day that she had, in fact, missed the mark. She did not do this to shame herself. She did this to be able to make amends. She said, we need to repent for collusion, our collaboration in the sin of silence. Because she realized in the streets on that day that she and the others had stayed silent while the lives of one after another, one after another of their precious young people had been taken. And to make amends, her religious resistance began. We resist temptation. We resist dieting and drinking 10 cups of water and getting enough sleep. We resist exercise. We resist thinking about things which we don't want to think about. And we can resist realizing that uh, just the idea that we feel that we have a choice about whether to resist or not sets us apart from many who know down to the chill in their heart that they do not have a choice, that they must resist. So religious leaders all over the nation today were asked to preach about resistance from our faith tradition. Why, you might ask? Why would we be asked to do this? Isn't resistance just oppositional? Isn't it just negativity? Why do we have to think about that? We are sad about the state of the world. We want levity and comfort. Of course we do. And yet, our faith calls us to embrace these needs and the larger needs of our world that is our religious call. Theologian Bernie Loomer, whose words um, Sean and read so well, also speaks of the idea of size. This is his idea of a religious frame, one that calls us out of our own small particularities into something larger and more expansive, something beyond our own needs and wants. And I believe with all of my heart, as someone who has spent a lot of time thinking about these things, has studied these things, as somebody who has it in my DNA from my father, who at age six 
along with other Japanese Americans, was taken out of the life that he knew and put behind wire and guns. I know that it is important to understand and comprehend these needs outside ourselves and to understand them as religious matters. So what does that mean for us? From our tradition, which lifts up ideas often of the positive, everything that we can be, people who affirm the inherent worth and dignity of all, people who lift up our interconnections through the web of existence. Religion is another word that some of us struggle with, but we are in fact, folks, a religious body. That is actually why we come here on Sundays. <laughs> and it's from the same word that brings to us the word ligament, to bind together. So religious resistance binds us to something larger than ourselves. It binds us in a healthy and growing way to work together to create some new creative good. Size. Power that is not unilateral. Power that does not just say, I want you to come to me and be like me in my way of being. Power that is open to some new expression that could come forward if we are actually able to be in relationship with each other. Religious resistance is about opposing those things that make us think we live in opposition to one another rather than those things that help us see that we need one another to survive. And what does this look like in just practical senses? It might be being with someone who needs us to be there, accompanying them. It might be speaking out sometimes when it's hard to speak out. It might also just be the act of listening. Because especially in the last couple of weeks, as I've listened to the ways that we are all breaking apart among us, I have come to realize that too often we do not simply do that act, just simply to hear another's truth, not to fix it, but simply to comprehend it, to let it be, not to fact check it, but simply to let it be. Resist racism, resist classism, resist nationalism, ableism, homophobia, transphobia. Resist a sense that there is one dominant way that is somehow the norm and the only right way, that unilateral sense of power. Resist hate and fear-mongering and the idea that the dominant culture has all the answers. That our truths no longer need to be discovered and that we don't really need to be in that deep dialogue of discovery. Resist a consumer-oriented culture which says that having a lot of things and keeping them for yourself and for the, your people is the goal of life for we know our size is bigger. We believe in more than this. So we were asked by PICO, the parent organization that brings congregations together across the nation for justice work, people of all different faiths, to mark this weekend as a time to reflect on the theology of resistance. And guess what? Next week we were asked by the Unitarian Universalists amidst us who call themselves the Black Lives of UU to re reflect on the concept of white supremacy and white centeredness and what it means for us. Two weeks of this, <laughs> we were asked and you are here. Give yourselves a hand. We were asked this week particularly to look at it from a faith perspective, to look at it from a theological perspective. Theology is the study of God, and many of us don't even believe in anything we would call God. And yet, maybe we believe in something that's big enough. Now, I will tell you about the God I do not believe in. I do not believe in that God who is the white man with a beard, even though I love many white men with beards. <laughs> I believe in something I actually do choose to call God, but for me it is a process. It is a larger awareness that comes when we look beyond our own narrow frame and we truly can embrace, even just for a second, the frame of another. Henry Nelson Wyman, who was a contemporary of Bernie Loomer, said that this God was, was really nothing more than the creative good, the creative good that happens when there is a mutual interaction at such a level that each party is transformed and something new is born out of the relationship. 
our religious resistance is to those things with drive wedges which keep that creative contact from happening, which hold people apart. And it takes faith. Because no matter what your theology of resistance is, it is not that easy to put it into action. One of the slogans of the PICO campaign, PICO, an organization that is run predominantly by religious leaders of color, one of the slogans is, I am created in God's image. Hashtag, do you see me? We are being asked to reach outside our comfort and see and hear and feel with our neighbors and our friends. So on Thursday, this has been a week, let me just say. On Thursday, I was making my way to a meeting. It was actually a meeting with um, our wonderful minister emeritus, David Sammons. And at the corner of Oak Grove and Treat, a car was inexplicably facing into the curb. It was dangerously angled out into traffic. And I quickly flipped myself around because I was concerned that someone had had some kind of health concern that had led them to, to stop driving properly. But instead, I found inside that, that car a young mother whose first language was not English with a three-year-old child in the car seat behind her. She was frozen with fear. She didn't know what to do. With the help of a man who had also stopped, willing to place his truck as a block in front of hers, the mother and the child were given enough cover to leave the car, and then the three of us were, were on the sidewalk together while he was out with the car. We stood on that curb awaiting help, and people drove by, and a disturbing number of them felt a need to shout obscenities and threats. The little girl with her pink hair clips and her little pink tutu just kept wrinkling her nose, very puzzled. She couldn't understand what the people were saying. People were honking and gesturing and screaming out hate. And there was one driver in particular who made her squint. He was way over, four lanes over in traffic. He was a car who was not at all obstructed by this path where her car was, this car whose steering had inexplicably locked and was now blocking lanes. This driver still though he was not personally inconvenient, still felt a need to let loose of his power in the climate in which we are. Go back to your country, he screamed at the three of us. We are being asked to resist. We are being asked to accompany. We are being asked to be with, to resist efforts to dehumanize. We are being asked to resist as if we would a disease a harm to someone we love, a diminishment of our personhood. We are being asked to resist uncomplicated stories and the need to be right all the time. We are being asked to resist attempts to harm other people's children as you would as if it were your own child or your own grandchild or your own great-grandchild or your niece or your nephew or your cousin. For that is what we do as people of faith if we actually believe that every person has inherent worth and dignity and that we are all, in fact, bound together in this interdependent web of existence. That's what we do. We resist the things that block that from happening. We need to resist shutting down because someone who lives under very different circumstances than perhaps we do asks us to consider words we do not want to consider or to hear experiences we don't want to know ever happen. The words might be words like white supremacy, which speak for some people of power and privilege centered in whiteness in our culture. We may hear one thing when we hear those words. Maybe we should listen to what the people who are asking us to hear them mean when they say those words. Words like resistance. I got a number of emails from people saying they would not be coming today because they do not like that word. We don't all like the word, but we need to hear the stories. Bernie Loomer was a Unitarian theologian from the last century, and he talked about power, as Seanan shared. He also said this, our readiness to take account of the feelings and values of another is a way of including the other within our world of meaning and concern. Our reception of another indicates that we are or may become, we are or may become, large enough to make room for another within ourselves. 
our openness to be influenced by the other without losing our identity or sense of self-dependence is not only an acknowledgement and affirmation of the other as an end rather than a means to an end. It is also a measure of our own strength and size, even and especially when this influence of the other helps to affect a creative transformation of ourselves and our world. And then he says, the strength of our security may well mean that we do not fear the other and that the other, once we have related to them, is no longer an overpowering threat to our own sense of worth or safety. It is in this sense that we as people of faith are being asked to resist despair, to resist hopelessness, to choose where to use our power and resist divisions which pit us against us. So much needs to be done, and we are all so tired. And I am watching as relationship after relationship, as organization after organization eats itself because of the fear it has of what is happening outside itself. And we need to be careful not to fall into that trap in these very, very, very wearying times. And we need to offer hope. The hope of deep listening, the hope of resistance, the hope of being able to tell someone's story that perhaps they think no one will hear. Yesterday on our campus, someone's life was taken through a violent act. It looks, though we will do not know, and we may never know, that that act was one of despair. That life, that life, had worth and dignity, and yet in those moments, that person did not know that. In the final moments of their life, that person did not know that they had worth and dignity. A father and two children discovered that loss. And our members were here, preparing for the celebration we have every year that is our new member dinner. And those few members invited that family in they comforted the children. They spoke and comforted the father. Our assistant minister, Renwa Hamami, was on the scene. She helped to calm the fears of others who were arriving. Those were acts of love and resistance. And I couldn't help thinking as I talked to the police and as I tried to divert our members around the parking lot, what would it be like if more and more people knew that there was a place where they could be affirmed and their worth and their dignity. I talk to too many people now who are on that edge of despair. And I am seeing what all of us, counselors, social workers, and ministers are seeing, that fear is crushing so many. And people are taking out their anger by lashing out at others and also lashing out at themselves. When people do not see that frame of meaning, they are unable to resist despair. If you are one of those people sitting out there today feeling overwhelmed and desperate, your act of resistance is to talk to someone else. Talk to me, talk to someone else in the community. Let them know that you need that friendship and companionship. I understand that. It has been a wearying year for so many. And yet, if you are not in that category, even if you feel like you might have something else that you can give, then honor that. Offer that sense of worth and dignity to someone else. Love yourself, and then allow yourself to love others. Resist, resist efforts to churn up hate among us, which is so dangerous at this time. Resist the sin, the missing of the mark, that Pastor Blackman saw within herself, the sin of turning away. Our neighbors live in that danger. We have been asked by religious leaders from our most vulnerable communities, by black pastors, Jewish, Jewish activists, Muslim leaders, and our undocumented neighbors. We have been asked by our fellow Unitarian Universalists of African descent to hear their pain and to engage in that creative interchange with them. No, it is not fun. It is not amusing and it is not comforting on the surface, but there is a deep comfort that comes from engaging with what is before us and knowing that we have resources to offer. Those of us who are not visible targets for hatred are asked to be part of resisting it and making pain visible 
Part of making pain visible is not to weep alone. This is what it means to be part of community and not to be afraid of weeping. We need a willingness to be vulnerable, to admit our mistakes, because the God that we serve is too large to be certain that we are always right. We need to be willing to be in that form of power that is about creation. Nonviolent resistance is deep within our movement for true inclusion, inclusion and change. And it's the lifeblood of creative interchange which leads to new good. You may resist that word resistance. It may seem negative. And yet it is a positive for a person who is steeped every day in an atmosphere where hatred and scorn are increasingly the norm. Yes, resistance means to push back. In our tradition, we push back with love. We push back from an understanding that life is about more than our immediate self-interest. Resistance can be a force, and it is a force of love. Writer Courtney Martin says, the ongoing challenge of this moment seems to be assessing this force accurately and perpetually and mounting a creative collective counterforce resistance. In other words, we love, resist, and love, resist, and love, resist, and love. Real love is not simple or superficial. It is radical because it's tied to inherent dignity. This is our theology of resistance, or my best attempt at it. You know, sometimes the alleluias that we sing aren't quite as grand and glorious. I listened to that piece done so beautifully by the choir at this service, and I had an image in my mind of the creation of the universe, all that mixture and all that emergence, and then something beautiful and peaceful coming out at the end. We are needed to engage in a kind of relationship that will offer us new truth. We are needed to engage with our theology of resistance. We are needed to offer love to counter hate, to be willing to understand that hate is real and not look away, to stay woke and resist despair. So let us be part of that counterforce. Let us meet demonization and division with love and unity. May we be the ones to make it so. Thank you.